<laughs> we good, Kevin? Are right. uh, you guys all good to go? I'll stay at the back. I'm going to go get a camera and come back. Thanks, Ujo. Are we going to start? So, thank you all very much for being here today. My name is Benjamin Hoffman. I'm an associate professor of French and the director of the Center of Excellence at Oral State. Today, I have the pleasure of, of introducing my colleague, Professor Jan Curtis from Kenyon College. Before introducing Professor Curtis, I would like to take a few moments to thank the sponsors that make this event possible. The Department of French and Italian, the Center for Languages, Literature, and Culture, and the Center of Excellence at the Ohio State University, as well as the French Embassy in Chicago and the French Cultural Services in the United States. Jan Curtis is an assistant professor of French at Kenyon College, where his research and teaching interests center on post-war French literature and film, youth culture, and the history of psychiatry and psychoanalysis in France. He received his PhD from Yale University in 2020 after completing a master's in psychoanalysis at the Université de Paris <laughs> and an AB with highest honors in French at Kenyon College. In 2017-2018, Curtis was a visiting student in the Department of History at Sciences Po and a pensionnaire étranger at the École Normale Supérieure de la Rue du Rhin. His talk today is taken and adapted from his book manuscript, The J3 Affair, 1948-1951, Modern Literature and the Memory of Occupation in a Post-War Murder in France. Based on his dissertation research, for which Curtis was awarded the Marguerite A. Pair Prize from the Department of French, at Yale University, Curtis's monograph is built on an original archival discovery and retraces and analyzes the crime committed in the name of literature and philosophy. Recently, Curtis was awarded a faculty research grant from the Kenyan College to pursue his on-site work in France, where he previously conducted research on the George Lucy Travel Fellowship. In June, Curtis published an article on literature in the Journal of Foreign Languages and Cultures, which extends his work on post-war youth culture, delinquency, and the popular press to the artwork and annex of Isidore Vizou, Guy Debord, and their young collaborators. His talk today is entitled Feeding Literature, Reading and Responsibility in the Post-War French World Case. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Curtis. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for that introduction. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to OSU on the behalf of the Center for Excellence. Thank you to the Department of French and Italian uh, and to uh, Christine and to Sujan and his colleagues uh, for making all of this uh, happen with so many moving parts. So on a Thursday afternoon in December of 1948, Two high school students met at the Place de la République in Paris. Their names were Claude Ponconi and Alain Guyadère. They were classmates at a private co-educational school and close friends. Together, they traveled to the town of Malnou, about 10 miles to the east of Paris. When they got there, they followed a set of train tracks out of the town and then walked off into the woods, Guyadère in the lead and Ponconi following closely. Ponconi then pulled a pistol out of his coat, shot Guyadère in the back, and emptied his victim's pockets. Uh, you have some representations of this from the popular press. Uh, after that, Ponconi went back to Paris, where he did his homework and went to bed. Guyadère managed to crawl out of the woods, uh, but died later that day in the hospital uh, from his wounds. The story of this murder was highly prominent in the French press for about two and a half years from December of 1948 when the murder occurred until May of 1951 when Ponconi's trial concluded. The scandal even inspired a novel and two nonfiction books and also two films. The facts of the crime itself, which I've just described, uh, aren't particularly interesting. What fascinated France and eventually all of Europe and even the United States 
were the ways in which Ponconi and his friends, many of whom it turned out knew of his plans to kill, to kill Guyadet, the ways in which they explained what Ponconi had done or tried to explain what he had done. Ponconi claimed alternately that he'd killed Guyadet in self-defense, that he'd killed Guyadet out of jealousy, and that he killed Guyadet as an act of patriotism, that it had been a patriotic execution. In support of this last uh, claim, Ponconi said that Guyadet had been a Nazi, an arms dealer, a spy, and a murderer. Ponconi said that Guyadet was going to kidnap a young woman whom he, Ponconi, was in love with and take her to Canada in a private plane, uh, which Guyadet either apparently owned and had somewhere or was planning to steal. At one point, Ponconi even uh, said that by murdering Guyadet, he had, quote, killed a character from a legend, end quote, as if Guyadet were in some way superhuman. Now, Guyadet, it turned out, had made up a lot of these stories about himself. Most, if not all, of Ponconi's absurd claims about his teenage victim were tall tales Guyadet had told about himself to his friends at their high school. At the time of his death, Guyadet had only just turned 17, but people took Ponconi seriously. The post-war French intelligence agency in charge of counter-espionage, which was essentially the uh, French CIA of the post-war period, launched investigations into Guyadet's supposed political spying in Northern France, Great Britain, Israel, and the United States. Ponconi had all kinds of stories about his motives. And he even said that he'd been inspired by literature, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. The last thing I'll say about why this case was so interesting is that it's a classic mystery in the sense that the more information you get about Ponconi and his act, the more confused and ambiguous his motives seem. And the more the affair at the time lent itself to all kinds of everyman theories. For example, Ponconi had actually been inspired by a recent film about gangsters and prostitutes, or that he killed his victim for money, or that he had an inferiority complex or an Oedipus complex. Educators, judges, religious figures, doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, characterologists, novelists, playwrights, and one famous actress turned writer all chimed in. The fundamental question was the following. Was the crime more than an isolated incident or did Ponconi represent the current psychological and moral state of youths in France? Almost everybody was in support of this latter hypothesis. The idea was that he'd been deeply affected by the German occupation and so potentially had the rest of his generation. Ponconi came to be seen as a representative of or even a stand-in for a specific subset of French youth who were referred to as J3s. The investigation into his crime came to be known as the J3 affair. And the term J3 came from the wartime and post-war ration cards that adolescents uh, carried. And the term J3 then was extended metonymically to refer to anybody between the ages of 13 and 21 who carried these uh, ration cards. Claude Ponconi's crime and the scandal it engendered, the J3 affair, sparked a national conversation about the historical and cultural causes of youth violence, and by extension, about adults' responsibility for the tragic events of France's recent past. The J3 affair felt unique as a historical event because of the ways in which the story of the murder engaged discourses such as literary modernism, French existentialism, Nazism, and communism, mid-century commentators, agreed almost universally, almost universally that such a crime could not have taken place anywhere else or at any other time in history. In my manuscript, I argue that the J3 affair played a pivotal role in defining a new cultural category in France, the J3s. My work departs from existing scholarship, which has tended to equate J3s with juvenile delinquents, to show that the new designation constituted a historically specific subset of youth and that this new classification compelled commentators to reframe the problem of youth violence, which was soaring during and immediately after uh, World War II, to, frame, to reframe this problem 
uh, in explicit relation to the facts of France's uh, years, uh, 1940 to 1944. At a moment when French adults placed a great deal of hope in the country's young men and women, uh, this was the moment of new wave cinema, of new cuisine, of new everything. Um, a moment when French adults were placing a great deal of hope in young men and women, and in the future, J3s, on the, on the contrary, recalled the recent past. Youths were referred to as J3s when their stories became fait divers, miscellaneous, often scandalous news uh, pieces. This, uh, for example, is, is one, um, one newspaper that I went through beginning in 1949, end of 1948, and through uh, uh, midway through 1951. And it's by no means an exhaustive uh, selection of the small news items about kids acting out, but uh, it gives you a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a sense here. Uh, this happened, uh, children or young men and women, especially young men, became J3s uh, when they formed gangs, robbed churches, stole cars, acquired guns, killed their grandparents, uh, these are the subjects here, uh, and so on. Often these stories referred explicitly to World War II, and even when they didn't, the term J3 uh, in their titles, which you can see here, recalled the war implicitly. These were the ration cards that were left over from World War II. The idea was that certain young men and women had learned bad behaviors from what they had witnessed and experienced during the occupation. The J3 affair was viewed as the clearest example of the war's effect on French youth. One boy killed his classmate and called him a Nazi. This is all important context for my talk this evening, but I'm not going to talk too much about the political dimensions of the affair uh, today. Rather, I'm going to talk about the role that literature played in the scandal. Debates about literature in the J3 affair tell us a great deal about the ways in which France conceived of youth responsibility in the years following World War II. As always in the J3 affair, commentators went to great lengths to deflect blame from a young man who killed in cold blood for seemingly no reason at all. The idea of literature served as a kind of a screen onto which French adults projected their fears about young men like Ponconi and allowed them to engage in a conversation about the moral health of their entire country. Today, I'm going to talk about three different moments during the J3 affair when literature played an important role for those involved or for commentators of the affair in the national conversation. The first was when Ponconi underwent a psychiatric evaluation a few months after his crime and seemed unable to talk about himself without recourse to his favorite authors. The second time was when a rumor circulated that Ponconi's lawyer planned on blaming literature for his, client, for his client's uh, crime. And finally, the third time was on the day uh, the first day of Ponconi's trial, when he had an extended conversation about his literary tastes with the presiding judge. In all three instances, the idea was that literature was being used to explain Ponconi's crime. The idea was that Ponconi, in all three instances, was pleading literature's influence in much the same way that one might plead temporary insanity. His interest in literature was discussed as potentially an extenuating circumstance. So, uh, the first instance. The first time Claude Pocody spoke on the record about literature was three months after he killed his classmate, Alain Guillaudet. He first described uh, his readings in March of 1949 during his psychiatric examination with Dr. Baudouin, chief medical officer at the, department, uh, the departmental psychiatric hospitals for the greater Paris area. Speaking with Dr. Baudouin, Pocody described himself as a young man tormented first by uh, passion, uh, and then by remorse. Uh, he says at one point, tout cela ne pouvait plus durer. J'ai essayé de me libérer l'esprit. J'aurais mieux fait de me tuer. Et après, osé infernal, des sueurs froides, la tête vide. Et je suis vivant, et Guyadère est mort. Je le vois en rêve. And you have, um, in parentheses, the notes of the uh, psychiatrist. Passion and remorse were the principal themes of the psychiatric evaluation. And to illustrate and explain these feelings, Ponconi called upon literature. During a Rorschach test with the, psychiat with the psychiatrist, Ponconi described one inkblot in the following way. 
So let's put down corbeau. So the corbeau de Rambo. Uh, he means the he means Poe's reason, not Rambo's reason. Um, but le, le remords fait partie de nous-mêmes. C'est le prolongement de la passion. Un passionné n'agit pas, mais il réagit. Il attend la mort. La passion mène au crime et le remords tue le criminel. Les choses sont bien faites. À quoi sert la justice? So here, Pongoni identifies a bird which he associates with a poem which describes his own feelings of remorse. Pongoni was playing by the rules of free association, which of course was the whole point of the test. But Dr. Baudouin was concerned by Pongoni's apparent inability to talk about anything without the intermediary uh, of poetry. To Pongoni, everything seemed poetic. Everything seemed merely poetic even, from ink blots to his own jealousy to murder. Uh, jealousy, uh, because remember that in one version of the, the facts, uh, he killed his uh, romantic rival uh, for a young woman named Nicole Illy. The psychiatrist also noted that Ponconi seemed to be trying to develop an argument. Almost, he said, as if he were writing a, a, a composition uh, for a French class. Ponconi was using poetry to develop a theory of the crime of passion. Passion leads inevitably to crime, which leads to remorse, and then ultimately to death. Describing another ink blot, Ponconi said, Ce noir image d'un spleen, Verlaine, Verlaine, l'assassin, mon ami, Verlaine, qui a tiré ce Rambo, avait eu tort. Once again, the ink blot evokes the name of a poem that describes Ponconi's own feelings of melancholy. Verlaine's spleen is a poem about a woman, and it closely resembles the feelings uh, that Ponconi described for Nicole Illy. Verlaine's poet discusses his ennui regarding almost everything and everyone, except, of course, the lady in question. And what's worse is that he lives in the fear that she will leave. Je crains toujours quelque fuite à trosse de vous. I always fear one of your horrible flights, the poet exclaims. The evocation of Verlaine served to illustrate, uh, to illustrate <coughs> Ponconi's feelings for Illy, but it also strengthened his argument about crimes of passion. By identifying himself with Verlaine, Verlaine, uh, l'assassin mon ami, Ponconi placed himself in a tradition of passionate poetic shootings. Verlaine, of course, shot but did not kill his friend uh, Rambo in a rage. Uh, Dr. Baudouin remarked that Ponconi was clearly attempting to, quote, sublimate himself through poetic affectation, end quote. Perhaps at the same time, Ponconi was working on his theory of crimes of passion, the idea that passion leads inevitably to crime. In his report, the, psychi the psychiatric expert analyzed several poems Ponconi himself had written in prison. And now it's possible that uh, these poems were taken from Ponconi. It's also possible that he wrote them and gave them to the judge. Uh, but either way, it is entirely reasonable to wonder whether Ponconi might have known or at least suspected that uh, these poems would be read and interpreted in an endeavor to understand his uh, behaviors and motives. One poem describes the crime itself. Most of the poems describe the crime. Uh, one of them describe, describes the crime in uh, the following way. I'll let you be the judge of the literary merit of the poem, but it goes like this. Ton grand corps blanc et rouge à l'aube honte mon âme. J'ai saisi l'instant de transition où la vie a quitté ton corps. La mort s'est installée et en moi le remords. J'ai vu ton grand corps blanc parmi les herbes vertes, humides de mes pleurs et de ton cœur. In a long letter to the investigating judge, the victim's father, Raoul Cuyadet, claimed the poem had been inspired by Rambo's Le Dormant du Val. Raoul Guyadère's analysis was rather sharp. Son crime lui est matière de lyrisme artificiel, inspiré de Rimbaud. J'ai vu ton grand corps blanc parmi les herbes vertes est une réminiscence du dormeur du phare. Il est étendu dans l'herbe, pâle dans son visage. Raoul Guyadère used Ponconi's poem as evidence of what he called the cabotinage, which could be translated as play acting or posing. For Alain's father, Monsieur Guyadère, Ponconi was playing a role. Uh, he thought to impress Nicole Illy. I'll give you the uh, text of uh, the poem by Rambo. Now, Raoul Guader may have been and probably was uh, right about this, uh, Ponconi's interest in impressing his, his love interest. I want to point, though, to a major difference between Ponconi's and Rambo's poems. Rambo's poet is essentially absent from the poem, except perhaps when we hear him apostrophized. Nature berce le chaudement, il a froid. Nature cradle him warmly, he is cold. Ponconi's poem, on the other hand, is all about the poet, who is clearly Ponconi himself. 
The image of the dead body haunts him. He watches the death happen. He is remorseful. He is crying. The divergence from Rambo's poem reinforces the hypothesis that Ponconi may have written this poem with Dr. Baudouin and his judges in mind, that playing the part of the poet might have been a conscious tactic. Like the explicit references to Rambo, or rather Poe, and Verlaine during his psychiatric evaluation, the poem may have been meant to highlight Ponconi's remorse, even perhaps a specifically poetic remorse. Whatever Ponconi's intentions were, in the end, Dr. Baudouin was convinced. At the top of his report, he noted, it seems that this was a murder of passion. There was a love rivalry over young Nicole Ivy. And in his conclusions, Dr. Baudouin explained that Ponconi's mo uh, motive of jealousy was, quote, plausible and, quote, normal. So again, whatever Ponconi's motivations were, and we will never know, this is how it worked out. Baudouin concluded that Ponconi demonstrated, quote, hyper emotivity and, quote, pragmatic inadequacies. As Ponconi had said, he was all passion and regret. And as he demonstrated, he couldn't talk about anything real without the intermediary of poetry. At the end of his report, the doctor even recommended that Ponconi's judges take his poetic nature into account when the time came for sentencing. Quote, the abnormalities I have enumerated above constitute an element of the nature that attenuates to an extent his penal responsibility. In France in 1949, if you committed a murder, being a young poet was an extenuating circumstance. Part two. Raoul Guyader, whom I mentioned, uh, the father of Ponconi's victim, you see him at the right here, uh, the one who spotted Ponconi's interest in Rambo's poetry, was himself an amateur writer. At the time of the J3 affair, Raoul Guyader had published a collection of maxims a novel and three books on sex and secret societies in Paris. He was acutely interested in fictions and in mysteries. Early on in the investigation into Ponconi's crime, and I have to say, the, um, looking through the archive, it is fascinating to see the role that the victim's father played in the investigation. It, you know, maybe not half of the documents, but a solid chunk of the documents are letters written to the judge with summaries of how the police have bungled uh, this list of evidence or how a newspaper has falsely reported on. And in, he played an incredible role of a detective here uh, to the point that he was criticized for it because he didn't seem to care at all that his son had been killed. Um, he's a really fascinating uh, character. Another aside, there, the, one of the books that I showed, one of the nonfiction books that was written by Andre Billy was in fact written by Raoul Guyadet. Uh, in the archive, there is also the manuscript of this book, which Guyadet sent to the judge. Um, and you can see that the, you know, the, there are diagrams in his hand. You know, this is a document he has given the judge. And it was later given to his friend on the BE so that it could be published as a legitimate seeming uh, 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 piece of writing that was written by somebody who belonged to the Académie Goncourt, you know, um, in any case. So, um, Early on in the investigation into Ponconi's crime, Raoul Guyader met with his friend André Billy to discuss Alain's death. Billy was an accomplished novelist, a literary critic, and a journalist, and belonged to the prestigious and highly selective Académie Goncourt. The two men first met after Billy reviewed one of Guyader's books in 1937, uh, and they became friends at that point. When Raoul Guyader went to see André Billy during the J3 affair, he didn't just want to talk about the death of his son. He also wanted to discuss literature. He wanted literary advice from an expert. He told Billy that Albert Boutra, Ponconi's lawyer, was planning on blaming the influence of literature for his client's crime. Um, and I don't know if this was ever the case. I found no indication in the archive that there had ever been communications about this. But at some point, a rumor started that uh, Albert Boutra was going to blame literature. Guyadère uh, named the three works of fiction that the lawyer supposedly planned to focus on, all of which supposedly portrayed gratuitous murder. They were André Gide's Les Caves du Vatican, Jean-Paul Sartre's Erostrat, and Albert Camus' uh, L'Étranger. Later, Billy described their conversation on that day that they met to talk about Alain. Quote, we talked it over, we examined the question from every angle, and we concluded that for several obvious reasons, the Malnou crime, had no relation to the theory of the gratuitous act, end quote. Billy later denied categorically in writing that literature could have had anything to do with Ponconi's crime. 
And yet, when he spoke with Raoul Gruyadère, the two men seemed to have taken the idea very seriously, seriously enough to have met to discuss it and to have, quote, examined the question from every possible angle. And in fact, they took it so seriously uh, that uh, then and there, they decided that they were going to write a book about it, uh, as I've mentioned. It's hard to make sense of the kind of literary strategy that Billy and Rieder discussed, this defense strategy. For one thing, the fictional murders in Gide, Sartre, and Camus have little in common when you really think about it. Gide's character, Lafcadio Luqui, makes it his express mission to act in a way that bucks logical causality. Rien ne m'empêche autant que le besoin. Je n'ai jamais recherché que ce qui ne peut pas me servir. Je suis un être d'inconséquence. His crime, he pushes a stranger uh, out of a moving train, is an enactment of this philosophy. In Erostrat, the short story, on the other hand, uh, Sartre's Hilbert carefully plans a crime against humanity and against the humanists. His motives are abundantly clear. Uh, uh, he, in fact, even writes a letter. Uh, I forget how many copies of a letter that he sends out to all of the, the humanists to explain himself. Uh, his is a crime of protest, which he hopes will one day bring him notoriety. He compares himself to the fourth century BC Greek arsonist uh, who wanted to become famous and who burned down the temple of Artemis. Hilbert reflects at one point, quote, son histoire m'encouragea. Il y avait plus de 2000 ans qu'il était mort et son acte brillait encore comme un diamant noir. And Camus uh, Merceau, of course, gets roped into a quarrel he has no stake in. He kills a man on the beach and later explains that he did so because of the heat and the glare of the sun. So there's no unified message here. We find an unmotivated murder in Gide, a senseless murder with an absurd motivation in Kemi, and in the case of Sartre's character, very clear motives. Obviously, comparing Pompidou to Sartre's character wouldn't have painted the boy in a favorable light. And the claim that Pompidou had sought to imitate the Gideon gratuitous murder is problematic in its own way. Uh, and it's really rather funny when you think about it. It amounts to saying that Pompidou committed an unmotivated murder motivated by unmotivated murders, right? So I point all of this out simply to insist on how absurd the defense strategy would have been. Uh, and again, I found no evidence that this was ever a real project. And in the courtroom, the lawyers never bring up any of these authors. And yet, adults in Paris seemed fascinated by Pompigny's claims regarding literature. He'd written about Camus in his journal, uh, journalist got a hold of it. He said at one point, ceux qui n'ont lu ni Camus ni Gide ne comprennent rien, cette histoire, something like that. Journalists really seized on this. And even those commentators who were skeptical of the idea that literature might be to blame, such as the novelists themselves, such as BD, uh, ended up protesting too much, so to speak. Perhaps the best example of this uh, is the case of Ici Paris, a weekly tabloid that published letters that Camus and Gide uh, had themselves written to Raoul Guyadet. It was an attempt on the part of the paper uh, to show that the writers themselves denied responsibility. Ici Paris was uh, working closely with Raoul Guyadère. He was sending them all kinds of stuff and they were publishing it. Um, but the paper misrepresented Camus' uh, letter. If you look on the left here, uh, this is literally fake news. Uh, the title of the piece uh, it published was, it's a mouthful, Albert Camus rejects the claim made by Pomponi the J3 that he committed a gratuitous assassination inspired by Camus' work. But you see how the uh, paper puts certain words and phrases uh, in capitals and, and bold to create this very kind of misleading uh, reading experience. Even though they published the entire letter, um, it, it, this is not at all what can letter actually look like. Um, so, uh, 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 what Kenny actually said was far more complex. Essentially, he admitted that books and their authors might be partly to blame for the crimes of Pomponi and, and those like them. Uh, he wrote to uh, the victim's father uh, uh, after Raoul after Guyadère had solicited a response, Rien ne me prouve hélas que ce malheureux assassin n'a pas lu en effet les livres dont il parle et qui n'ont pas agi sur lui dans le sens qu'il dit. Dans ce cas, si dur que cela soit pour moi, je serai coupable également. At the time of Pompigny's crime, the notion that contemporary literature might be blamed for murder seemed to commentators entirely plausible. Part three, uh, 
During the first day of the trial, the first questions uh, that Fonconi had to answer concerned his literary interests. Fonconi's tastes had changed since he'd spoken with Dr. Baudouin during the psychiatric evaluation over two years uh, previously. When asked about André Gide uh, uh, during the trial by the presiding judge, Fonconi replied that he'd read Les Fomonnières, Le Cap du Vatican, and La Symphonie Pastorale, but he had nothing positive to say about them. Quote, I don't like the way he describes characters, end quote. Um, Fonconi asserted his disdain for literary creations like Lafcadie. He wanted nothing to do with Gide's creatures of inconsequence, in other words. In response to a question about Sartre, Fonconi said he'd only read one essay by the philosopher, L'existentialisme et l'humanisme. In essence, he was denying that he'd ever even read Erostrat, the short story that supposedly his lawyer had planned to blame the crime on. And again, we'll never know what Fonconi thought, but L'existentialisme et l'humanisme is a particularly interesting choice uh, uh, to, to cite. It's an essay in which uh, Sartre talks explicitly about the Gideon Act with disdain, you know, saying that I've been confused with uh, the capriciousness of the literary creations of André Gide, uh, um, you know, and, and where uh, Southwest philosophy comes across as um, being far more humanistic than, uh, than, it, than it does elsewhere, I think. Um, when asked during his trial about what he thought of Southwest's essay, Camus responded that he hadn't understood anything. The books Ponconi praised during the trial were not ones he brought up before. They were Michelet's Histoire de France, The Tales of Alphonse Daudet, La Rochefoucauld's Maxime, and La Bruyère's uh, Les Caractères. He lauded Flaubert's style and the psychologies of Stendhal's characters. It was as if Ponconi, whom by now everyone saw as a literary criminal, uh, were trying to reinvent himself as a reader, one better suited to a courtroom full of middle-aged men. Fonconi even went so far as to condemn his own poems. Quote, they seemed good when I wrote them, but years later, what disillusionment, end quote. On the first day of the trial, Fonconi presented a literary side that was far more serious, less passionate, less existentialist than his earlier comments suggested. It may be that Fonconi's distancing himself from his poetry and from his earlier readings was part of an effort to present himself as a good reader, uh, as a reader of good literature. This at least was the effect that the performance in the courtroom had. The novelist Joseph Kessel, who was at the trial, said the conversation between Ponconi and the presiding judge resembled a conversation between two good friends, two equals discussing poems and novels. One important dimension of this new approach, whether it was a conscious strategy or not, was dismissing Gide's capricious characters in favor of Stendhal's heroes with their Napoleonic psychologies. And uh, Fonconi, it's worth mentioning because it was often insisted upon in the press, was Corsican. Um, so there was also a, a similarity there with Napoleon. What, on day one of the trial, Fonconi claimed his favorite novel of all time was Le Rouge et Noir. The hero of Stendhal's novel is Julien Sorel. Uh, the bookish son of a carpenter, he obtains a job as a tutor to the children of the village's mayor. And from there, he begins to climb the social ladder, mostly through his rather awkward seduction of women. His first conquest is Madame de Renal, the small town mayor's wife. He executes his plan of seduction in the way that he believes Napoleon uh, would have carried out an attack against an enemy. And incredibly, despite himself, of course, he succeeds. Toward the end of the novel, he shoots Madame de Renal for having revealed their affair. He calls the attack an act of vengeance. She survives, but he is sentenced to death for her attempted murder. Now, when the presiding judge asked Ponconi, after he mentions that Le Rouge Noir was my favorite novel, the presiding judge asks him, what do you think of the judges who condemned Julien Sorel to death for the murder of Madame de Renal? Ponconi responded, I think they failed to understand it. Pierre Cise, um, uh, a very famous journalist of the, of the period who covered the trial for Le Figaro, was one of a number of reporters who adopted Julien Sorel uh, following the first day of the trial as a new literary model for Ponconi. Uh, uh, de Julien Sorel, uh, de, de Ponconi à Julien Sorel was a subtitle in the story he wrote after the first day of the trial, from Ponconi to Julien Sorel. Uh, Verlaine was the literary model Ponconi had chosen to explain his so-called crime of passion, initially with the psychiatrist. 
Now, Ponconi's story regarding his motives had changed, and he had a new literary example. Incredibly, when asked about his repeated assertions that he committed his crime out of jealousy, right, that was the whole point of the Verlaine narrative, uh, Ponconi denied that he'd envied Guyader. Quote, jealousy is a word that would explain too poorly, end quote, said Ponconi uh, in the courtroom. To hear Ponconi tell it in May of 1951, during the trial, his crime was not one of passion, which had kind of really been his hope all along to say that it wasn't premeditated. Um, so this was a rather shocking uh, proclamation. Uh, instead, he said that his crime was related to a question of duty. Speaking of Nicole Illy, Ponconi asserted that Guyader, quote, wanted to lead her away from her duty, to take her away and corrupt her. Another quote, there was impurity in Guyader. I wanted to remove the impurity. So there was something in Ponconi, it seemed, of the Napoleonic ethos of Julien Sorel, who acted in accordance with a Napoleonic sense of vengeance. After the first day of the trial, Cis called Ponconi, Cis the journalist, for the Figaro called Ponconi a moralist, perhaps half ironically. He described Ponconi as a young man who'd abandoned his contemporary authors in favor of Stendhal's Napoleonic hero and who'd attacked a man to avenge a young woman. So to sum up, we have seen three distinct literary Ponconis or, or, that appear over the course of the J3 affair uh, from early 1949 um, to May 1951. The first was the Ponconi of the Psychiatric Report, a jealous, passionate killer whose literary model was Verlet uh, and who was himself a poet, et cetera, et cetera. The second was uh, the Ponconi of the Gratuitous Act, the one supposedly motivated by Gilles, Sartre, and Camus. And although this was, of course, a supposedly a creation of his lawyer, which then got kind of blown out of proportion by the newspapers and in the uh, conversations of André Billy and uh, Raoul Guyader, this was all based on things that Ponconi had said either in his journal or to reporters. Uh, he had made these statements uh, about these three uh, uh, modern novelists, contemporary novelists at the time. Third was Ponconi, the moralist, the moralist. Pierre seizes Ponconi of duty and vengeance. Ponconi as Julien Sorel, or a certain interpretation of Julien Sorel. Now, interestingly, these three Ponconis are Ponconi, the writer of literature, right, the poet. Uh, Ponconi, the reader of literature, the reader of Camus, Sartre, and, and Gide. And finally, Ponconi as a literary character, right, identified with Julien Sorel. And of course, there's no way to know which of these Ponconis is the real one, and I'm not here to tell you uh, uh, which is the true Ponconi. As I said at the outset, the J3 affair is a mystery. Uh, the more you learn about it, the harder it becomes to give one explanation for Ponconi's motives. What is certain, however, is that the, re that the refraction of Ponconi's literary character tells us a great deal about what exactly uh, was so important about the J3 affair for post-war France. Since each of these literary Ponconis reflected a dominant post-war concern about French youth. The jealous, passionate Ponconi, Ponconi the writer, poet Ponconi as Verlaine, matched the disturbing image of young men that Françoise Dolto, for one, uh, Françoise Dolto, who would go on to become a, one of the most famous uh, psychiatrists, uh, psych psychoanalysts and psychologists in France, uh, a portrait that she painted in a 1949 article on the J3 affair. And she was not the only one to uh, uh, articulate such ideas, uh, but she did so in a, in a particularly powerful way, I think. Uh, she called Ponconi's crime a murder of homosexual passion and attributed it to a failed unconscious attempt at achieving genital sexuality and even subjectivity itself. For Dolto, Ponconi was trying through his crime of passion to solve an enigma that was specific to post-war French youths. Ponconi belonged to a generation that, in Dolto's view, had been symbolically castrated and developmentally stunted for historic reasons. Uh, and it really is a very interesting article that in many ways is uh, very kind of Freudian by the numbers, and in other ways is very sensitive to the particularities of the, the present historical moment in ways that, uh, especially in the mid-century, psychoanalytic theory is not. Uh, there are other treatments of Ponconi um, that, are, that, are, that are far less nuanced and um, 
and psychoanalytic treatment of other faits divers uh, from before and after, I would argue, have tended to be less sensitive to historical uh, context or the particularities of a situation. Think about how uh, the press talked about Violet Nozier as a, as a Freudian, uh, right, um, without taking into account any of the sort of social uh, uh, gendered aspects of the crime and what had been committed. But that's a bit of a, a different um, subject. Um, so the fact that Bonconi chose to compare himself to Paul Verlaine, Dolto doesn't say this, but the fact that he chooses to compare himself to a man who passionately attacked his male lover and not a rival in a homosexual love triangle, heterosexual love triangle, would of course only strengthen Dolto's argument that Bonconi's crime of passion and his failed attempt at mature sexuality, i.e. heterosexuality for Dolto, um, had the appearance of a homosexual act. So this was something that other people seized on as well. The second Ponconi, Ponconi the existentialist, and I'm using that term kind of in the way that the popular press used it uh, at the time, um, which was not in an entirely nuanced way. Sartre was a kind of a meme uh, in the popular press. Here he is with his, his head on Tarzan's body. Um, uh, so to be an existentialist was to be a rebel, was to you know uh, drink in the uh, les sous-sols de, uh, the, the Saint Germain uh, region in Paris, you know. Um, so this is the second Ponconi, Ponconi the existentialist or Ponconi the absurd hero, Ponconi of the gratuitous act. This Ponconi neatly represents the realization of the fears of mostly Catholic critics who accuse modern literature uh, for youth misbehaving. And these were debates that were going on before the J3 affair uh, and continued after, but um, really crystallized around Ponconi. Even Albert Camus had his doubts regarding the potential effects that books like his could have. Third, and most interestingly, perhaps, the Ponconi that, per, that uh, Pierre Cies called a uh, moralist reflected another important concern of the time. There was a widespread belief that the experiences of the Second World War had broken the moral compass of many of Ponconi's generation, that the war had inverted their values. This was the shared opinion, for example, of a group of psychiatrists, psychologists, judges, pedagogues, and social workers surveyed by one Dr. Uh, Simone Marcus Gessler in 1947. Marcus Gessler reached out to these different professionals in the hopes of understanding the steep rise in criminal cases among juveniles following World War II and, and during the war as well. Her respondent, but it was after the war that when the numbers didn't seem to go down, it was very surprising, right? Because the, the the narrative had been, well, of course, there's acting out, we're occupied, this is uh, not, these are not normal circumstances, but those numbers continued to climb even after the war. Her respondents cited, among other things, the phenomenon of the black market. The practice of intercepting requisitioned goods from the occupying Germans had been a kind of devoir patriotique, uh, patriotic duty during the war. Essentially, the occupation had created an obligation of disobedience and an inversion of moral values. These were the opinions of the respondents to the survey. These opinions, which were shared by a great number of legal and psychiatric professionals and educators, help us to understand Pierre Cise's statements about Ponconi's morals. They help us to grasp Cise's concern for a young criminal who seemed to believe that he committed a murder in accordance with, a, with certain moral principles. For Pierre Cise, Ponconi was not an anomaly. Seized like many, many commentators called the J3 affair, le procès d'une époque, the trial of an era. Let us be attentive, he wrote just before the trial, for what we are about to witness is not just the trial of two lost boys. It is the trial of the society where we live and where they grew up. End of the quote there. The J3 affair was for just about everyone, the story of an entire country and its culture on trial. Falconi's crime allowed all of France to engage uh, in a conversation about its history and its collective guilt after World War II. One last thing before I conclude. I, I, I said at the beginning of my talk that throughout the J3 affair, commentators almost always did everything that they could to shift blame away from the young men and toward something else. Falconi's verdict was the clearest example. Uh, it can only be called a fictional verdict. His jury found him guilty of murder without premeditation 
but it also gave two of his friends prison time for helping Ponconi prepare the crime in advance. Understand? They said Ponconi hadn't premeditated his crime, but two of his friends were found guilty for helping him premeditate his crime. I haven't had time today to go into all of the ways in which Ponconi's friends participated uh, in the crime, but their participation was obvious. There was no way that they were going to uh, get off the hook. The jurors could not have found them innocent. But Ponconi's jurors seem to have wanted to do everything they could to lessen Ponconi's sentence. Even though his friends had helped him prepare the crime, he had not premeditated the crime. Their solution was to propose an impossible verdict. The, the crime had been planned and not planned. In the end, Ponconi was sentenced to only 10 years in prison. Uh, when he, and when the judge announced the sentence, Ponconi was ecstatic in all of the photographs. It's just, you know, he, I think, truly did believe that he might get the death penalty, like Merceau, for example. I believe literature played a role in helping him benefit from such leniency. The jury, the jury essentially followed the psychiatrist's advice, right? For Dr. Baudouin, Ponconi's, quote, poetic exploitation, for exploitation of details was evidence of an abnormal character. The boy was oversensitive, out of touch with reality, and therefore couldn't be held entirely responsible. The present moment with its memories of occupation and with its culture was an, extenu an extenuating circumstance. Commentators approved almost unanimously of this senseless verdict. Once the verdict was announced, you read the papers, almost universal uh, approval. Uh, Joseph Cassel was uh, high, very disappointed, uh, but that's a, that's a different story. Everyone seemed relieved, frankly, and Kessel included, um, I should say. One paper called the decision, quote, more moral than logical. Um, Pierre Cise wrote, quote, anyone who might be tempted to see in the verdict a certain incoherence should remember that Ponconi could have gotten the death penalty, end quote. The one commentator who did not approve of the verdict was Jean Paulon. Uh, and I'll conclude with this anecdote. Paulon was, of course, a famous man of letters who was in charge of La Nouvelle Revue Française in 1951 at the time of the trial. Shortly after the trial, uh, he responded to a, a request for comment from a reporter at Le Figaro Littéraire. Now, his response was never published, but I came across it in uh, the archives of the Bibliothèque Jacques Doucet in, in Paris. It presents a perversely original take on the trial and its outcome. Paulon describes Ponconi as un garçon droit et passionné, and echoes other commentators when he observes that la prison n'a rien à lui apprendre que des vices. Prison will teach him nothing other than vices. Uh, and then Paulon proposes a solution that is as unexpected uh, as was the contradictory verdict that the jury gave. Like the real verdict, Paulon's plan, idea that he gives the journalist, is all ethics and no logic. But unlike the jury, Poulon makes no effort to respect criminal law in his proposed punishment or non-punishment, as the case is, of Ponconi. And his approach to ethics is, again, a rather perverse one. Il me semble, he writes, it seems to me, qu'un état bien ordonné lui condamné à mort pour l'exemple. A well-ordered state would have condemned him to death, you know, simply for the example, for sake of example. Uh, Et dans le secret, lui aussitôt dirigé avec Nicole, pourquoi pas, sous un faux nom, vers le Groenland ou les îles Kerguelen. And then, in secret, would have taken, would have quickly taken him, along with Nicole, why not, under a false name, to Greenland or the Kerguelen Highlands. And then he concludes, mais nos, démoc mais nos démocraties manquent de secret. But our democracies lack a sense of secrecy. With this simple solution, Poland goes further than anyone in embracing the element of fantasy and fiction, of mystery, that were inherent to the affair. And the romantic desire for the adventure that drove the J3 game from the very beginning. These stories of stealing planes and spying and selling drugs and, and so on. Poulon writes a fictional but fitting conclusion to the stories the J3s elaborated, one that gives Claude and Nicole a denouement worthy of their own powers of invention. Poulon recognizes that there is no acceptable current model for dealing with these young men and women, these J3s. So he imagines a new France, a well-ordered state that, unlike the present democracy, 
embraces exactly the kinds of secret plots on which the J3s constructed their game and their mystery. Although Poulon's ideas are unlike anything else that appeared in accounts and commentaries of the trial, his letter was also the most candid and creative expression of the widely shared opinion that the J3 affair was exceptional and entirely new, and that the criminal justice system was not equipped to handle such a case without bending the rules, just as the jury essentially did. In a way, Poulon, like everyone else, used the affair to reflect on the current state of French society and to conclude that France was doing its young men and women a disservice. In his own twisted way, he considered the J3s more seriously than anyone else did. Seriously enough, not only to reflect on what their crime meant for France, but even to take up the story himself and add his own chapter to the chronicles of Claude Pompidou and Nicole Thank you. If there are questions, I'm of course more than happy to answer them. I'm, I'm gonna to try to um, uh, stop sharing my screen so that I can see uh, the Zoom uh, chat. Yes, uh, Renaud, please. Thank you, Yann, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. I can't wait to read the manuscript. Is it published in the next month or you know, okay. Forthcoming. <laughs> okay, it's, it's very, very fantastic. I didn't know actually the story of the uh, J3 affair is very absolutely fascinating. As a kind of basic question, something maybe broader, but the specific question is about the uh, Perception of the affair by the uh, French press. Uh, I presume that it was covered by maybe journalists from the US or other countries. So, what is, you know, it's still very uncle français, right? It's a big debate about literature. But so, how is it perceived by, by the uh, foreign press, my, my perspective? And the second question, you, you won't be surprised, is about post war the transitions from, from what you piece. Of course, I mean, I totally understand that it's very specific, but there is something to say about. About what 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 you write, the, you know the on say the club is Jeffrey and and these you know memory of Ishi and and, and and the doctor. But what about the post war the post war because you know it, it's something that I I also see the in the early twenties you know this this fear of of the development of criminal and violence and 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 the French blaming the absence of fathers for four years fighting the trenches and and the absence of glory that led me. Uh, young uh, men to to give up some kind of of, of violence. So I wonder if again there's something to say about about post wars in, in general. Yes, excellent, excellent questions. Um, I I wish I knew more about the um, international reception. Um, you can see here I uh, have just a couple little images. Uh, one of them is a uh, several. It was a several oh, yeah. page article in Life. Um, with, uh, with lots and lots of photos. So there was an American journalist, um, and I'm not remembering his name, but who covered the, uh, who covered the trial. Um, and, and you can see from the headline, J3 murder in France, a generation's ordeal. So, I, I, you know, oh, and I've actually um, found a number of other, it's not the focus of the, uh, of the project exactly, but I found a number of other newspapers uh, from the United States uh, that talked about this and that really kind of adopted the, the narrative that, you know, the dominant narrative in France. Uh, look what's going on in France. Um, in, uh, in, in Italy, for example, it, it's very different. Uh, this is a short, uh, uh, a short clip uh, newsreel uh, that I don't even remember where I found now. I'll have to go back into my notes, but that, uh, that presents this, uh, this problem here as a European phenomenon. Uh, and the film, one of the two, films that I show here is a, is a film by, um, by Antonioni, which is actually a sort of a triptych of a, of a, of a film. Uh, the first, I think the French one is first, and then maybe the English one, and then the Italian one. And there's, but there's a, an introduction. So there's three different short films, one of which is in French that takes place in France. One is in Italian that takes place in Italy, and one is in English that takes place in, in England. And they're all stories of these Enfant terrible. Um, and there's a very interesting introduction at the beginning of the film that's also in Italian, but that is explaining sort of what the film is about, that is showing, um, you know, things like this. 
uh, images of uh, newspapers, short, uh, short, uh, uh, you know, uh, video clips of uh, riots and things like that. Um, there's even there's a big uh, image of of Claude Ponconi, uh, and there's a short clip where you see him talking with his lawyer. Um, so, the, for Onson, you know, the, the the project is clearly to juxtapose three European countries where the same kind of thing is happening. Um, so that's that's what I'll say about the uh, the international um, sort of coverage in terms of post wars. This was a big debate, and you had uh, François Mauriac. Notably, who was really pushing back on this uh, hysteria, as he saw it, of wow, you know, everything is so bad right now. Uh, uh, Gerard Bauer is another um, playwright and 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 writer. I have a picture of him somewhere. Who who was also, you know, mostly. And these are people writing in Le Figaro and Le Figaro Littéraire, who tend to be uh, André Billy, also, of course, a writer for uh, Le Figaro, Le Figaro Littéraire, who are pushing back against this sort of hysterical idea that the present moment is so much worse than uh, than previous moments. Um, I don't know, I'm not finding this. Oh, here we are. This, uh, uh, you can see uh, Gerard Bauer there with, uh, with the other. Um, but the interesting thing, uh, just in terms of the uh, perception at the time, is that even somebody like Bauer who sets out to, to, to say that this is the, not only the same as what happened at the end of World War I, but what happened after the war with Prussia and look at the novels of Emile Zola and it was the same kind of um, uh, degeneration. And, you know, there's a, there's a chapter where I sort of close read that article and draw out the moments where he's, as he's saying that nothing has changed, he's complaining that there are young men in the back of the courtroom who are smoking and that this never would have happened when he was a young man. And, you know, uh, so it kind of, you know, it kind of keeps coming out. The other, the other response is, you know, would be, you know, I'll steal the the, the idea of John Merriman, you know, who, who pointed out that at the end of World War One, you know, there there was celebrating that happened. You know, there was a feeling of relief. Uh, whereas at the end of World War Two, the Cold War has already begun, and so it, you know, that's a one of the major preoccupations here is World War Two. But the other one is. The Cold War and this other film here, Avant le Déluge, is uh, is actually a film about um, the uh, the Cold War, and it's uh, it's a sort of a reinterpretation of the J three affair, where the uh, all of the students at a high school are sort of breaking off into teams, the Americans and the Soviets, and uh, and it's a group of kids who don't want anything to do with politics, and they have this plan to leave to escape the atomic bomb. Um, and the same thing happened in the J3 affair. They were spying on the Russian embassy, they thought, because they were worried about it. So, you know, there are certainly similarities. And, and, you know, when I insist so much on the historical specificity, I'm especially interested in how specific people at the time thought it was. But I do think that there is something new in this moment with the conclusion of one war that immediately becomes another war. It's a terrific question, and I realize I'm supposed to repeat the questions for those who are on Zoom. So, so the question was, um, you know, what, what to make of this focus on French literature? Um, all of the works that I mentioned were of French authors. Uh, Pomponi talked a lot about French authors. Yeah, I don't think, and even when he talks about Poe, he thinks it's Rambo. Um, so um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And yeah, it's, you know, so rewind. Uh, to 1946, I think, is the uh, the Giry Crachet affair with Boris Vian, and this whole scandal uh, with um, this pornographic novel that is supposedly written by a black man in the United States that Vian has translated into French. There, the sort of the, the crisis was our literature, our national literature, is being infiltrated by Americans. Um, and this was around the same time that uh, that Henry Miller 
was being censored uh, by the same guy, Daniel Parker, who was trying to censor Boris Vian, uh, well, censor the fictional author Boris Vian had created. So that was a whole different thing with, with um, fears about um, maintaining the purity of the national literature. And um, again, in that, it was really, it was all about the children, right? There's the, uh, the, the novel gets left on the bedside table of a murderer. Do you remember this story? And the book gets, Vian gets blamed for uh, assassinat par procuration, you know? Um, and that's what we remember, but that's not what the scandal really was for a long time. It was about pornography and the fear that if you read the legal documents that Daniel Parker is uh, throwing at Vion, it's all about fears of corrupting the youth, corrupting the youth, corrupting the youth. So that's a consistent fear here. In the case of Pantoni, yeah, he only, he only cites French works. And I think that the debate, once again, a debate that was, that was pre-existing, um, one that, uh, that Moriac was certainly very involved with, had to do with the, the, you know, the deterioration of the quality of the national literature, right? I mean, this was why one of the reasons that Sartre was such a, you know, bête noire in, in Samedi Soir and other tabloids, you know. Um, I, you know, that's, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting observation that I'd like to think more about, but I think it's really significant. That I don't think that the debates would have been the same if he'd been citing uh, Dostoevsky, for example, or, or some other model of a young man committing crimes. I think then, um, I don't think that the anxieties would have been the same and would have felt as sort of close to home. So I don't, that's not a, that's not a very satisfying response, but it's an excellent question that I, that, that I thank you for, because I'd like to think more about that. I don't know if you have, yes, please. No, or remind me. Um, then, um, that the drummings served some of the drumming, he was a famous British um, scientist, if I'm not mistaken, were traveling in France in the 50s with his wife and his daughter, and their dead bodies were found on the side of the road where they had apparently cleaned up. And he was on the property of the Dominici family, the family of Cousins, but from uh, a little bit later. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, it's it might be it was one of those things that, and it didn't yeah. put the Corsica stamp there. That was also the Corsica stamp. Yeah. Um, and Beck wrote an essay mm. about it where he condemns the French elite, as Beck would say, in journalists and the lawyers of using literature to condemn. Without enough evidence, that they they wove together a story um, about the um, savage peasant that he became mm -hmm. a literary character for them, um, and it's an even it's even uh, juxtaposition because here um, the, the one accused is a literary writer. In a way. And he appeals to the sensibilities, the literary sensibilities of the Belgian mm -hmm. because, of course, as, as we know, the, the French, those were the French elite, still are, um, and they all would have been seeped in the literature. And we all studied it. Many of them were amateur writers, as right. I mentioned. And so, obviously, the literary sensibility really helped um, um, this criminal. But they used their literary sensibility against uh, the Ricci, according to the back in the notes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's just an interesting parallel. You know, this is this connection between literature and institutional mm -hmm. competence, which of course Scott wrote about quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I don't know, just an interesting a very a very interesting parallel. And so the, the parallel was with the Dominici affair. Um, that every, every time that I get a chance to talk about this research with anybody, I find a new parallel. Um, yeah, I, and, I no, 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 it's, it, oh, absolutely. It's really interesting. And certainly, um, you know, people have said, you know, I'm certainly not saying that this was the first literary, you know, or the last one, uh, you know, 
uh, a case of literature on trial. I mean, again, Jacques Cachet was an example of that. I mean, there were literary trials of the 19th century. You know, there were um, there was uh, there was Morisse, who you know, in the 19th century, who was so enamored of um, of um, oh goodness. Um, the, uh, the the dandy bandit um, anyway it'll come to me but you know um, who was a poet himself uh, and and um, and Maurice gets you know the judge essentially diagnoses him of uh, falling prey to literary um, how does he put it uh, alcoolisation literaire he's been he's got he's been you know inebriated with literature and that's the cause for his um, his crime so. And then, I mean, and you have Leopold and Loeb in the United States who are reading Nietzsche or whatever, you know. Um, so. It's interesting how literature works for one, one piece and against, and against the other. And how would, and, and you didn't say also mean what his um, social class was. You said Corsican, which works against him, but was it Right. That is also an excellent question. So, that next, so the the next question is about the sort of the social class of these uh, of these individuals. So, they're they're all at a private coeducational uh, high school in the 11th arrondissement in Paris, which is which is interesting. You know, at the at the time, um, there weren't so many uh, of these kinds of schools in Paris. So it's a it's a school you have to pay to go to. In Ponconi's case, it is uh, Ponconi grows up with a uh, single mother. His father disappears during the war. I, I think he, he maybe is initially deployed to go somewhere and, and doesn't come back. His paternal grandfather feels terrible about this and supports Ponconi in his education. Now, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, and the affair has been sort of mentioned in other cultural historical books, you know, and it's the question of class comes in and it's, it's always the reference made to, well, this is a private school. In Ponconi's case, in Ponconi's case, his, his grandfather is paying. Um, in, and there's the one of this 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 there was this weird novel that was written about the the case L'Épreuve here. Uh, Maurice Descartes is a is a journalist um, and not really kind of never uh, his career as a novelist never took out. But he he reinterprets the J three affair and he makes it all about social class. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, the Ponconi character in his novel is this sort of um, lower uh, bourgeois character who goes to this private school with these more comfortable students from more comfortable families, but who lives in some sort of public housing where everybody else is working class. And so he's between these two worlds and he's worried that either the American capitalists are gonna come and invade France. Like, this was a fantasy at the time is that World War II is going to reproduce it. There's going to be a new occupation. And it's either going to be the American capitalists or it's going to be the Russian communists. What was I said, didn't that happen? Well, there you go. Um, right, exactly. So he doesn't know, he sort of is stuck and doesn't know which side to, in reality, I think the students at this private school were not in such good shape. Um, they're all, you know, uh, there are anecdotes. At one point, a journalist, this is probably a tangent, but at one point, a journalist goes undercover, pretends to be a student, and actually gets his mother, who's actually the secretary of the newspaper, to enroll him at the school so that he can go and ask questions and figure out what the students know. And he talks about what it's like in the school. And they don't have heat. Uh, they don't have, you know, uh, school supplies. They have this right after the war, and they have, they have nothing. So, um, He's doing okay, but he's not, you know, this isn't a story about, um, but, I, but I think that he is more or less on the level, on the same level as his friends. I don't think that there are the kinds of class differences that are portrayed in the novel. I mean, obviously, you have literary contention, so perhaps class contention. Yes. Um, yes. Which may have appealed, <laughs> or, you know, that appealed, I would assume. Yes, well, and he's and he's a you know he's a fascinating case too. He's got terrible health. Um, he's kicked out of several different schools for just essentially failing to you know uh, make the grade. And he finds 
you know, he sort of finds himself in this character of the poet. Um, and, you know, Nico Iri thinks that he's interesting. Uh, and he tutors her in French, right? Which is a, so it's, yeah, he's, I mean, he's looking, he's looking for an identity um, and, and he finds it with the, the, the image of the poet. But isn't that just said that you're very, very much a mystery in many respects, but I'm just wondering if that could bring so much time at researching this, uh, you go into the archives, if you came up with your own interpretation, and then you uh, you know, like the scissors in order with uh, this other document, and if your interpretation is going to find a place in the manuscript. That's an excellent question. So for those who are on Zoom, the question is, I've presented this as a, as a, as a mystery that doesn't have a right answer, but do I uh, have my own uh, hypotheses and are those going to make it into the book manuscript? Well, the, to answer your first question, I, I, I do have my own suspicions. I, I, do think, I do think that it's a love story at the end of the day. I, I, I really do. The one thing the one thing that is consistent in what Bonconi is doing and saying all along is that he is absolutely committed to and obsessed with this girl. Um, there's no question that it was that the crime was premeditated. Um, other students participated. There was a meeting. We call it the the Conseil de Guerre, where they all got together and voted to uh, kill this guy. Um, I don't think that most people thought it was actually going to happen. Uh, it was all part of the game, but. I do think it's a love story. There are some interesting letters. Some of the most interesting letters in the archive are from Pocony's friends. They're sending them to him in prison. There's one that's really interesting. It's from one of his best friends and getting closer to the, to the trial. And he writes to Pocony saying, you know, and again, this could have been, maybe this student also suspected that his letter was gonna get intercepted. Maybe this was calculated, I don't know. But he says, you know, Pocony, I, I think, you know, it's been a couple of years now and you're, I really do think you killed for Nicole. I really do think that this, and, um, and Pocony and Nicole got married after they got out of prison. Um, they got married uh, in, I forget, I think 1956, I think by 56, 58, you know, less than 10 years later though, everybody's out of prison and they're married. Um, and when I was doing, you know, the most of, most of the archival work for, uh, for, for this project was when I was in graduate school and, uh, and living in Paris, I, I found relatives of, uh, of Pocony just through Facebook. Um, and for all kinds of different reasons, I, I stopped pursuing, uh, you know, uh, any idea of having a direct conversation with, uh, with, with Pocony or, or anybody else. But what I was told by the relatives was that, well, as far as we know, Pocony and, and, uh, and Nicole Lee are still living here in Paris. So, and they would have been in their mid eighties at that point. Um, so, I mean, I, I like to believe that it is a rather strange love story, but a love story nevertheless. And I, whether or not that comes maybe in an epilogue or something, I'll mention this, but um, it's a good question. So do you have time for one more question perhaps? One more? <laughs> I was just wondering how long have the children been Oh, excellent question. Um, so they, not so long, um, not so long. They both ended up at the, they were at the high school together for, I believe two years, I have to find this, but then Guyadère gets held back. He doesn't graduate. He's actually a class above Pocony, even though he's a year younger. And he gets held back. And they only become friends at the beginning of the school year, which starts in you know, early October or whatever. The crime takes place in December. They've only been friends, rivals, frenemies, whatever they are, for a, for a few months. And it, um, they are sort of connected through Nicole Idi. Um, she's really in this kind of between men situation where Pompidou and Guedard have nothing in common. Guedard is this really athletic uh, boy scout who's interested in transistor radios and camping and hands-on and he's popular. He's very weird, he, you know, in his own ways. A um, uh, really sexist character, really problematic, the kinds of testimonies that, that his female classmates give about him afterward. Um, 
he's always trying to intimidate people. He has a gun. He doesn't have any bullets for it, but he has a gun. Carries around salt and says it's cocaine. He says he's a drug dealer, you know, and he uses this to intimidate people. And Bocconi is this really just, you know, meek little poet, but they're both interested in Nicole and she provides this kind of, you know, conduit or um, way for them to sort of overcome whatever differences they have through this female uh, character. But it, it, it's extremely, extremely fast. And in the end, they're both trying to impress her uh, with these different characters they're creating. Pocony tries to buy a car, he tries to buy a gun, uh, he ends up getting a gun from his friend whose father is a police officer. Uh, there was a, I showed a one point, you know, he, he in front of many witnesses uh, said, I did this for you, Nico, after he does it. I mean, uh, the, the poor, you know, the poor girl here, it's a whole different story, but she is treated cruelly throughout this whole thing in the papers. Um, what's that? Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, there were all of these. She's blamed uh, often for you know what what took place, right? She seduced them and, and all of the rest. Um, that's another story, but uh, but but it's, an, it's the relationship uh, between the three of them is it's highly improbable and, and very interesting. I think. Sure, I'm a question. Can you Good, thank you. Great. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much for that. And it's a save. Perfect. Uh, have that for posterity.